So, who had a grand time yesterday afternoon in lab? Yeah, yeah we, we had that little smudgy, smoldery fire and everything got shut down, which has totally messed up my schedule for the labs, unless we can get people to come in this week. So, if you were in the Tuesday lab and you couldn't come in, I would appreciate if you'd come in either this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon during the lab, regular lab session. So it, it won't take the full three hours. We just want to make sure everyone knows how to raise flies. We'll lead you through the process. So I will be setting up flies today at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 4 o'clock. So if any of those times work for you, come on by the Science 3180 and we'll take care of that. Uh, and if today is just a mess for you, I know you've got, you got other labs and all this other stuff you have to do. Um, if you can come in tomorrow on Thursday to the lab, which starts at 1 o'clock, we'll get everyone set up. And let's hope there's no more fires ever again. Okay. So where we're at is uh, last time I talked about chromosomes. So here are these weird little blobs that you can visualize in the nuclei of cells. And you see them most prominently at about the time the cell is going to divide. So this was a clue to all those 19th century biologists that, hey, these might have something to do with cell division. So let's look at them more closely. Uh, the really big clue, though, is what we're going to talk about today, mitosis and meiosis, that these cells are associated with cell division, and they also do a little, little square dance in the cell, and they sort themselves out very precisely and separate in distinctive ways to the daughter cells. So that's what we're going to talk about today, this whole process. Okay, we'll come back. So we started last time, well, no, we've got, we got partly through things yes, last time, and talked about the cell cycle. And I told you that uh, during most of the cell cycle, chromosomes are kind of invisible. They're all dispersed, like this little beauty right here. And then during the S phase, those threads get replicated. And you all remember that from the cell biology. We're going to make a copy. So we have each chromosome is now consists of two strands of DNA, two identical strands of DNA. And then at the onset of prophase, they condense down. And that's when they get thick and are easily stained. And you can visualize them in a microscope. And at this point, they're double-stranded, they're condensed, and then they're, we're going to go through this thing we're just about to talk about. We're going to go through mitosis, or as we'll see later, or sometimes meiosis. Uh, they're going to go through mitosis, and at the end of that, those two strands are going to separate apart. And one of each of those two is going to go to each of the daughter cells that are produced by mitosis. So you get two cells out of this, and they're back to the normal state that you see here. Here's the, here's the steps we're going to go through today. There we go. Uh, so we're going to have to, we've got a couple things we need to do in order to replicate, in order to divide and produce two cells from one cell. One is, we obviously have to duplicate the genetic material. So we need to make a spare copy of chromosome 1 that we can pass on to our daughter cell. And then the other thing we need to be able to do is take those chromosomes that we produced and sort them out. You're going to end up with a cell that at the onset of mitosis contains now... Oh, we've got to think back a little bit. Remember I told you that there's homologs in diploid cells, that there are two homologous chromosomes. 
And each of those two consists of two chromatids, all that kind of stuff. So we got all these, these four strands of DNA, and they got to be sorted out properly. You don't want all four going to one, one, one daughter cell, and the other daughter cell gets nothing. You want precisely, precisely two strands to go to each daughter cell. And it's not just the sister chromatids. It's got to be the appropriate homologous chromosome. So it's a, it's a, superficially it seems like a tricky problem. Does the cell have to count? And no, it doesn't, because the way we're going to do it makes it really simple. Okay, as I told you, there's two steps here we're going to very briefly go over. On karyokinesis is the separation of the chromosomes and the nuclei. So we duplicate all those chromosomes and we split apart the chromosomes. Uh, and then independently, separately, but often associated with karyokinesis, we're going to carry out cytokinesis. And cytokinesis is the actual division of the cell. The cell membranes and everything. So you end up with two distinct autonomous daughter cells. If we don't have, if we don't carry out cytokinesis, what happens? Endopolyploidy. Endopolyploidy, yes. So we, we don't want that in this case. We're just going to, we just want to produce a, a nice copy of this cell. Said here, there are four steps. There are more than four steps, actually. Man, in the 19th century, they went crazy and gave all these Greek and Latin names to every little phase of every little thing. Uh, there were sub-steps to this. Uh, we're not going to worry about that. All you need to know is prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. It's that easy. All right, go on. There we go. So here's, here's prophase. So what we've got is a couple of things that have to happen. One is we got, there are cytoplasmic components to this. So we're going to be moving chromosomes around. In order to move chromosomes around, we're going to need cables and cytoskeletons and all these things that are going to tow all the chromosomes to their appropriate places. And central to that is the structure called the centrosome. Yeah, centrosome. It's completely different from centromere. Centromere is a location on the chromosome. Uh, centrosome is this curious little green thing in our diagram. And what it consists of is tubulin, microtubules. And they have a very specific orientation as far as I know, we don't understand why they do this, but it's, it's kind of universal, and they all do this, that you make this little cylinder of microtubules, a little short stubby cylinder, and then you make another one, and they line up at right angles to each other. So it's got a very distinctive structure. All of your cells have a centrosome. You have one centrosome sitting there. And in your cells that aren't dividing, they function as a microtubule organizing center. So microtubules radiate out from this. So it's like a seed crystal to make the cytoskeleton. At, at prior to cell division, the centrosomes have to duplicate. Okay, I don't know how they do that. That's a really interesting problem. You've got these two little clusters of microtubules and they assemble a second copy of themselves. So it's not just DNA that replicates. We're going to duplicate this cytoplasmic structure. Okay, and radiating from the centrosome, we have what are called spindle fibers. The spindle fiber is going to reach out and they're going to attach, attach to the centromeres of the chromosomes. So you've kind of seen this in this diagram here. Got these radiating lines coming off of the centrosome. Another thing that's going to happen, if those are going to attach to the 
chromosomes, and the chromosomes are in the nucleus, and the centrosomes are in the cytoplasm, uh, we're going to have to break down the nuclear envelope. So that nuclear membrane is going to retract, fold back, uh, get absorbed into the cell membrane. And then the spindle fibers can reach across there. And we're also going to get the condensation of the chromosomes, as I mentioned previously. So everything's going to get supercoiled. And they're going to appear here. Okay, in this little diagram here, I, I tell you something. I tell you that this cell is 2N. It's a diploid cell. How many chromosomes are in our sample cell? Did you say four? You are correct. There are four cell, there are four chromosomes in this model cell up here. So we've got four chromosomes. It's two N. So what is N? Two. Yeah, I keep telling you the math in this class is really easy, right? So far it's been pretty simple. How many chromatids are there? Eight. Eight, yes. Again, simple math. So you can see these, these little sausage-shaped things in this cartoon. Those are our chromatids. And they're linked at the centromere. So in prophase, everything kind of condenses down, and we get nice, tidy chromosomes like there. They start connecting to the spindle fibers, which are connected in turn to the centrosomes. There are also motor proteins that are associated with the spindle fibers. We got actin and myosin all playing a role in here, so we can move our chromosomes around wherever. And in metaphase, Metaphase is really recognizable because those chromosomes are going to get pushed and pulled and prodded and moved into the center of the cell where they wind up. So that's what we're seeing there. Uh, this is called the metaphase plate. And it just means we've got, we got a mess of chromosomes and they're all sort of semi-organized, lined up in the middle. Uh, we can see it in the actual photographs of the chromosomes up here that when you look in the microscope at them and watch them carefully, uh, you can see the chromosomes getting towed around by their centromeres, by the spindle fibers attached to their centromeres. And you, you can sort of imagine looking at that, that's things getting pushed and pulled and prodded into position there. And finally, they eventually line up in the middle. And that's where the forces are about equal. So you can imagine you got the spindle fibers reaching out and contacting the centromere of the chromosome. And both of these spindle fibers, illustrated by my fingers here, are tugging on the chromosomes. They're just kind of pulling them. And there's, they're pulling them in opposite directions. So they'll balance out and end up in the middle. Yes? Um, these spindle fibers, do they like attach to the metaphase or pull? They attach in prophase. But it's an ongoing process. Okay, so we're just going to pull and push and all this kind of good stuff on those chromosomes. They're going to line up neatly in the, in the middle of the metaphase plate. You can guess what happens next. So we got these chromosomes. That each one's made of two chromatids. And there are fibers attached to the centromeres. They're just kind of pulling in opposite directions on them. And then our next step, in anaphase, we're going to pull them apart. They're going to separate at this point. And notice what's happening. We are pulling apart the chromatids we're separating the chromatids in a single chromosome. And this is where the clever scheme comes into play. We want one copy of chromosome one to end up in daughter cell number one. 
and one copy of chromosome one daughter cell number two, one copy of chromosome two, etc. We we want them to divide up very precisely, but there's no counting necessary. You just got you you initially start with them all paired up, and then you separate the pairs. And if everything goes smoothly, if nothing breaks, you will get four, in this case, this model system, you will get four chromosomes to each side of the cell. And there will be two copies of chromosome one and two copies of chromosome two on each side of the cell. So the balance is maintained. Everything is perfect. We'll make a daughter cell that is identical to the parent cell. Okay, then after this we enter something called telophase. And what's going on in telophase? Well, we've successfully pulled them apart to separate sides. Uh, we're going to see the spindle fibers, fibers start to break down because we're going to rebuild the nuclear envelope. We're going to build two nuclear envelopes, obviously. We're going to build a little container for our chromosomes that we just separated out. And then also, these sausages will turn into threads again. So we're going to disperse the DNA into nice long threads. And usually then we'll get cytokinesis. Separation. Each daughter cell is 2N. And the two daughter cells are genetically identical. This is what we want. So we want to be able to make a whole clone of the initial parent cell. So we're going to just carry out these divisions that produce identical copies. Now, at the beginning of this, when we looked at prophase, I showed you this little diagram here. Uh, that's what the cell looked like at prophase. Here's what they look like in telophase. What's different? You can see it right there, right? Something's different about those two from prophase to telophase. What was that? The chromosomes and telophase you have a single, we usually don't call them chromatids at this point, but yeah, it's like a single chromatid. Here we saw the pairs of chromatids, so we've separated those. This contains two strands of DNA in each chromosome. Here we're back down to one strand of DNA in each chromosome. All right, so that's... That's it. That's that's pretty simple, right? No, I don't have a summary there. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, yeah. So we've got a, we've got this nice little cell division that occurs. We're going to produce a mass of cells that are all identical by carrying out this process of mitosis over and over again. So in your bodies, most of your cells undergo mitosis. So somatic cells, that's what they do. They go through mitosis. That's, that's kind of what you want. Almost all of your cells are identical to each other genetically, but not necessarily phenotypically. And they're, the so soma itself, your body, is produced by the amplification of cells that were present in the zygote fertilized egg cell. So we're going to build those all up. There's basically only one place where the next step occurs, and that's in your gonads. So here, this is how we make the soma. Now, I, I've got to introduce a little history here. This guy, August Weismann, Absolutely brilliant scientist. If you had a time machine, you went back to the last half of the of the 19th century, and you asked 
informed people who's who's the most important scientist in the world. Uh, most of them would tell you Charles Darwin, obviously, but their second choice would be this guy, August Weismann. It's kind of a shame a lot of people haven't even heard of him anymore. This is what happens when you're number two. You're just going to get forgotten. Anyway, August Weismann, what he did is he studied things at the cellular level. So he's asking about these questions that are really important for us geneticists, and that is what are the mechanisms behind inheritance and heredity. And what he proposed is this particular model, that uh, there is a germline, in this sense germline just means the cells that can contribute to the next generation. The reproductive cells that are found in your gonads. So oocytes, sperm, those kinds of things. That's the germline. And he says then there's also the somatic one. That's all the everything else. Everything else that's going through mitosis. And his proposal, which was actually directly contrary to what Charles Darwin proposed, is that there's no crossing the streams. That you can't have the somatic cells contributing to heredity. He postulated this thing called Weismann's barrier, which said somatic cells do not contribute to the next generation. Contrast the, that with Darwin's model. Remember his gemular hypothesis? We said, oh, the cells everywhere, they contribute something that migrates to the gonads, and there they assemble into a little mini embryo ready for fertilization and then development is largely a process of growth. But he's saying no that doesn't happen. Yes? Um, are there like, um, I guess I can argue basis and then like mitosis versus inheritance. Does that make sense? Say that again? Like when would mitosis first occur? Like did it stem from like a long term Line of or oh, you, you're talking in an evolutionary sense. Yeah. So it seems like a really complex um, like Oh, yeah, well, yes, it's, uh, is it that complex, though? I mean, if we, look, if we go to bacteria, if we look at single-celled organisms, uh, we don't find multiple chromosomes. We just find a single circular chromosomal loop. And there it's, it's going to be a little easier. We don't have quite as many steps to go through. Um, you do have to carry out the whole process of replicating the DNA. That was probably the hard part. But then sorting it out into daughter cells. Now nah, you just you've got two of them. You put one there and you put one there. Uh, the whole process of mitosis, that as we know it, would have that would have occurred in eukaryotes a long time ago. So this is something that started four billion years or so ago. So yeah, it's been around a long, long time. Uh, we'll see in a moment that meiosis is, seems to be a, a later version of it. Does anyone, somebody else have a question? Yes? Oh, is there something that Weissmann did? You know, is he just is he just making this up? Is he just saying this is the way it's got to be? Uh, yes, there were things that were observed. So um, he's he's taking a, a developmental biology perspective, and uh, you can do things like look at the gonads and ask what's going on in there. Do we see things migrating in, or do we see interesting phenomena where cells are just the cells there are dividing? Can we see any contribution from somatic tissues? And you don't. Uh, this is one of the strikes against Darwin's gemular hypothesis, is you don't see gemules. Things don't go moving around. So Weissmann is just saying, yeah, no, that's, that's not the way it works. Uh, it's also the case that in many organisms, the germline segregates out really, really early. So in Drosophila, for instance, 
if we actually observe the embryos, uh, what you see is you see a, this oval-shaped egg that's, that appears. And early on, after a number of divisions, there's a little cluster of cells that appear that move to the posterior end of the egg and are sitting there. And they are all the cells that are going to contribute to the reproductive system. So you can actually sort of see this in, in some organisms. It's messier in people, but yeah, it's still there. Okay, so that's one thing he proposed, is this Weissmann's barrier, the segregation of the cells into somatic versus germline. He also proposed this, that the hereditary material was nuclear. It's the stuff in the nucleus that matters. And, uh, you know, as he, he described it, oh, there's these loops and threads that do something funny. Don't know exactly how they work, but those probably contribute to heredity. This is another thing that's famous story. We haven't really covered so far, but I'll come back to it later in the course. And that is the development is a result of epigenesis. And what does that mean? Epigenesis just is the idea that in the early embryo, you've got this undifferentiated stuff. You've got generic goo. And progressively, over the course of development, it differentiates into the specific tissues like brain and liver and eyes and skin and all that kind of good stuff. So we'll come back to this because it turns out that how genes are modulated is kind of an important process. Yes? So would those be like stem cells that he's talking about? Yes, that's a, that's a related concept. Yeah. So stem cells are just cells that aren't committed to a specific fate. They can often be somewhat determined to a general class of fates. But yeah, they're, they're kind of waiting for signals, mm -hmm. let's say, differentiate into these more sophisticated, more advanced tissues. So then, I don't know if this is related, but would a stem cell be able to go into either the germline or somatic line, or do each line? Oh, I know that doesn't seem to happen. Okay. I mean, we can do it artificially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can you can plug out pluck out. So, for instance, uh, Dolly the sheep, they plucked out mammary gland cells and tricked them with certain chemical signals and got them to differentiate in a way that they could then use those as a germline. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not an absolute boundary, but it takes some artificiality to get across it. Okay. Well, my computer keeps turning off on me. We'll get there. Anyway, let's just contrast the two models. So you recall Charles Darwin's pangenesis idea. His stuff is coming from all over the place. And it's going down into the gonads. And then man and woman swap these, these things and you get a baby out of it. And then the cycle begins again. This allowed for acquired characters. It was also part of the idea of blended characters. So you get gamules from both mom and dad. And Charles didn't have great ideas about how those determine what's what. Weismann's germplasm theory is, is just illustrated here, that as far as reproduction goes, all that matters is that germline. So we're going to produce gametes. Those are going to get passed into a zygote via fertilization. And then there is a germline, this line right here, that is, this is solely responsible for reproduction and heredity. Everything else, well, that's just the meat robot we build around our gonads to make them walk around and carry out mating rituals. That's a very reductionist way of looking at it, but yeah, that's kind of what, what this is saying. Uh, and then again, these two are contradictory to each other. Darwin's theory of heredity is going to get tossed out, and we've got to explain this. Okay, another observation he made. So remember, I told you, okay, we're looking, we're looking at these cells that are going into mitosis, and they're all 2N. 
So in a human, of course, 2N would be 46 chromosomes. You would have 46 chromosomes. And then there's this mysterious process where we're going to have fertilization occur. We're going to take a cell from a female and a cell from a male, bring them together to make a baby. And here, Weissman is just pointing out an obvious problem with that. Well, if you bring together a 2N cell with another 2N cell, a cell with 46 chromosomes and another cell with 46 chromosomes, you're going to end up with a 4N zygote. You're going to end up with a baby that's got twice as many chromosomes as its parents. Well, that doesn't seem like it's going to work very well. So he suggested, without seeing it, this is a prediction he made, that there must be cells that only can't contain half as many chromosomes. So somewhere in this reproducing, reproducing organism, you must produce cells that in humans would have 23 chromosomes instead of 46. And then when fertilization occurs, what you're doing is bringing together a cell of 23 chromosomes with another one of 23 chromosomes. Poof, you get 46 chromosomes. Yeah, that's exactly what we want. Otherwise, every generation, the number of chromosomes would double. That sounds impractical. Okay, so again, he, he didn't see this, but he predicted it. And he also predicted the only place this would be occurring is in the germline. So you're only going to see it in the gonads. Mitosis is easy to study. You can study mitosis in skin cells and in blood cells. All kinds of cells you can study mitosis. Uh, but to study this next process, which is named meiosis, you got to look exclusively in reproductive tissues, in gonads, in plant ovaries, all these. So, so that's where we get where only a tiny fraction of your body carries out this process. But a couple of people found it. Edward von Van Beneden, uh, Theodore Bovary, and Oscar Hartwig. They found cells that do exactly that. They found that they found specific examples of cells where the cell division is different from the mitosis I just described. We're going to reduce the number of chromosomes in half, and those are going to produce the male and female gametes. Okay. These guys also saw this other cool phenomenon that once you've got these, these cells that are half, this, half the number of chromosomes, you can see them fuse during fertilization and form the zygote. Okay, so that's pretty clear evidence that, yeah, males and females both contribute genetic material to the next generation. Okay, that process is called meiosis. It's, it, as predicted by uh, Weismann, it cuts the, the genetic complement in half. And you might be thinking, hey, that sounds awful. Except remember again, I told you, in diploid organisms, we have pairs of homologous chromosomes, which sort of implies the obvious solution is what we're going to do is take those pairs of homologous chromosomes and move one of each member of the pair to a different cell. Okay, so we're going to go through a series of steps. First of all, uh, just like with mitosis, we're going to go through the cell cycle. We go through the S phase, which duplicates all the DNA. And at the end of that, what you've got is twice the normal amount of genetic material. Normal being the amount that you would have in G1 of the cell cycle. So this doesn't make a lot of sense. We want to have the quantity of DNA passed on in each gamete. But we start this process by doubling the amount of DNA. 
What does that mean? That means we're actually going to have to go through two divisions to reduce the amount of genetic material to half was what was present in the parent. So we're going to have two divisions. The first division is called the reduction division. So why it's called that is because we are going to separate homologous pairs of chromosomes. And what we're going to do is go from a 2N cell, a diploid cell, to a 1N cell. Okay? So if you're sitting there with two chromosomes number one in your somatic cells, the reduction division is going to split those apart so that each daughter gets one copy of chromosome one and um, one copy of chromosome two, and one et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that's why it's called the reduction division. It's actually going to literally reduce the number of chromosomes present in the very first division. However, remember again, after the S phase, all of those chromosomes are in chromatid pairs. So chromosome number one consists of two strands of DNA. So we have to carry out another division to split those up. So we need to split apart those chromatids. And that's going to occur in the second division, which is called the equational division. It's called the equational division because the number of chromosomes won't change. We'll have the same number of chromosomes. It's just that now they're not in that chromatid form. So instead of pairs of strands of DNA linked together, we'll split them apart into single strands of DNA. But the number of chromosomes doesn't change. Because remember, you count chromosomes by counting centromeres. So I'll show you that. You will see it in the illustration. You'll see why it's, it works this way. The first division is the weird one. This is where funky stuff happens. It doesn't happen in mitosis. The second division, the equational division, is exactly like mitosis. Okay, so this is the one where we have to learn something new here in the first division. Okay, let's go through it. So here's, here's a prophase of meiosis 1. And there's multiple ways you'll see it designated. Sometimes you'll see it says prophase 1, like I got here. Sometimes they'll be a little bit more precise and say prophase of meiosis 1. So don't get confused by the terminology. And in a lot of ways, this is like prophase of mitosis. And that's what's going to happen is we're going to get that condensation of the chromosomes. We're going to get the doubling of the centrosomes. We're going to get the breakdown of the nuclear envelope. We're going to get those spindle fibers reaching in and contacting everything. But there are some differences. And this is the big one. That the homologs have to pair up. Okay, mitosis they don't. In mitosis, okay, again, you got two copies of chromosome one, right? They can just ignore each other. They can just be anywhere in the cell. We're going to split the chromatids, remember, or split up chromatid pairs. Uh, in prophase of meiosis, prophase one, for this to work, we have to have the homologous chromosomes find each other. So they have to seek out specific sequential patterns in the chromosome that allow them to pair up nicely. So we're going to have to pair up chromosome 1 with its homolog chromosome 1. We have to pair up chromosome 2 with its homolog chromosome 2. So this is, this is a tricky process. They have to search each other out and find who's who and link up. And what they will do then is they will form something called a tetrad. Yeah, we got names for everything in the cytology of cell division. So a tetrad, you can see why it's called a tetrad, right? So now we got these two chromosomes, 
two homologous chromosomes. They are going to pair up, and each of those two chromosomes consists of two uh, chromatids. So we're going to call that a tetrad because there's there's four nascent chromosomes all lined up right there. They are then going to line up, pair up. There we go. And then a very important process is going to occur called crossing over. This is the basis of recombination, which we will talk about later. You don't have to worry about it for Mendel. Mendel didn't have this idea, uh, but we're going to see that recombination is really important in generating diversity in this thing. Uh, so we got these chromosomes pairing up, and then they swap bits and pieces. They, they form these little structures like right there. You see a little X shape right there, right there? This is a real electron microscope image of chromosomes in this stage. And they form these little things called chiasmata, where bits and pieces of the chromosomes are just swapped back and forth between the homologs. Also, sometimes between sister chromatids, but if you do that, it's invisible because sister chromatids are genetically identical. But yeah, so they're going to swap bits and pieces. It's going to generate more diversity in the chromosomes. Why is this important? Why is this useful? Because if you look at our diagram here, they colored our little sausages there. So what they're saying here is, okay, if you look in your cells, half your chromosomes came from your dad, half came from your mom. So let's say dad is the blue one and mom is the red one right there. So you got these tetrads forming. And they're eventually going to split. We're going to separate them out in this division. But this tetrad is all daddy's contribution, and this one's all mommy's contribution. Uh, maybe sometimes you want to mix them up a little bit. You know, what if what if your hair color is on one chromosome, and it's the same chromosome as your eye color? And dad has red hair and blue eyes, and mom has brown hair and brown eyes. If they don't mix them up a little bit, that means the only combination they could pass on is brown hair plus brown eyes, or red hair plus blue eyes. You could never get a red haired person with blue brown eyes. You get the idea? So we need to juggle it around a little bit more. And that's the purpose of this crossing over. And we're, we're going to go into that in great detail in a couple of weeks. Okay, so we're going to have this crossing over event occur. Oh yeah, let's, let's do a little accounting here. So right here in this block, that is one tetrad. And the tetrad is made up of two chromosomes. Can you count chromosomes by counting those little centromeres right there? So we get two centromeres, and together they make a tetrad, and that also contains four chromatids. Yeah, you know, that's, that's the kind of question I, I might ask you in a problem set or a quiz is, okay, how many different strands of DNA are present in this cell? And you, of course, would obviously immediately say there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, eight strands of DNA we have to sort out. And they're in two tetrads, and in four chromosomes, and in a total of eight chromatids. Yeah. Okay. Then we get into Metaphase, metaphase one. These are the same term. We're recycling the same terms. So it's, it's not quite as much memorization as you might fear. So once again, spindle fiber is going to pull and tug from both sides and will line up all the chromosomes at the metaphase plate. But notice in meiosis one, the homologs are still paired up. So we got 
two chromatids, two chromatids, and they link up like this. We are not going to separate the chromatids yet. This is the reduction division. We're going to instead separate homologous chromosomes. So there you see them all lined up right there. And then we go through a uh, anaphase, eventually. Actually, let me jump ahead just a little bit. So we're going to go through this step where we pull them apart, right? We're going to go into anaphase. This has another date name to learn. This is called disjunction. So we are going to take these chromosomes that are lined up there at the metaphase plate, and we have to pull them away from each other. That process is called disjunction, it's just separating the two homologous chromosomes. There is a slight complication in that we've had these crossover events. So sometimes the strands of DNA are getting a little tangled in here. And that's what you're seeing illustrated in this cartoon is sometimes you can see that because they're They've swapped a segment. There's a little chiasmata in there. A chiasm. And we're going to pull them apart. And sometimes they're a little adherent there. A little sticky or a little tangled. And they're reluctant to pull apart. So you can actually see these figures where there's a crossing over of it. And, and it's pulling it apart at the centromeres. Just sort of separating here. And they linger a little bit while they untangle themselves. So you can actually visibly see this sort of thing. Okay. Oh, there's more terms on here. Sorry, the terminology just gets going to grow and grow. Uh, so here we see a chiasma. This structure right here with just the pair of chromatids. They had to go and give it another name. It's called a dyad. Because remember the, the four, the two chromatids linked together, and the other two chromatids from the homologous chromosome, that's a tetrad, so half of that is a dyad. So you'll sometimes see that in the literature. Uh, the other thing you see in this diagram, and this is more cell biology than anything, is this structure is called the kinetochore. I've been calling it a centromere. For our purposes, we can just simplify it. Yeah, it's a centromere. Uh, centromere refers specifically to the sequence in the G DNA of the chromosome that forms this little region. The kinetic core refers to the DNA plus specific proteins that wrap around it to act as a handle. Okay, so we just we, we had this little aside just so I could throw more terms at you. I know, I'm kind of mean that way. Okay, so anaphase, we're just going to pull them apart. So you see here, the first division separates homologous chromosomes. So this side of this dividing cell is going to get one chromosome one and one chromosome two. This side will get one chromosome one and one chromosome two. That's what nature wants. Okay, so that's all going to go on here in an anaphase of meiosis 1. And then, as you might expect, there is telophase. And again, just like mitosis, what's going to happen here? Well, those chromosomes are going to start to disperse. We're going to reform the nuclear envelope. Spindle fibers are going to break down. Uh, we're going to go through cytokinesis. And this is this is all seems a little bit superfluous because in meiosis, remember we're going to go through two divisions. So here at the end of meiosis one, we set up this. We just redisperse, reform the em the envelope, and then immediately, right away, we break down the envelope and condense the chromosomes. But otherwise, it's just, just like what you'd see in mitosis. Okay, so then we go into meiosis 2. This is prophase 2. And it, like I said, this is exactly like mitosis. 
Homologs don't have to find each other because there's no longer homologs present in the nucleus. You still have to condense everything down. You still have to break down that annoying envelope. So we're going to do all that just like we would in mitosis. And then we're going to go into meiosis 2, that is metaphase 2. They're going to line up with the metaphase plate just like they did in mitosis, but you would say to yourself, okay, look at that, there's a difference between what we would see in meiosis and mitosis, and that this has got half the number of chromosomes. If you look back through your notes at the diagram of mitosis, you would have seen this little model cell has four chromosomes lined up at the metaphase plate. In the metaphase two, they only have two. And you can see why the previous division is called the reductional division. We have reduced the number of chromosomes by half. This cell only has two chromosomes in it. Or in a human, it would be 23 chromosomes. Then we go into anaphase. Same deal again. We're just we're going to split them at the we're going to separate the chromatids. So we're going to split them at the centromere and pull them apart, just like we did in mitosis. And then we go into telophase. So the nucleus reforms, the, the chromosomes disperse, etc., etc. And the end result is after those two divisions of meiosis, we now have four cells. And each of those four cells has half the amount of genetic material as the parent cell. Again, Weisbaum predicted this. So there's got to be something like this that goes on. So here we are seeing an illustration of the products of this. Again, we're going to pretend we condensed down the chromosomes again so you can see it. Uh, you can see that each of these cells has one copy of each homologous chromosome. N equals two, so it's got two chromosomes. It's a haploid cell at this point. Uh, we also see that we get crossing over results that kind of mix up the paternal and maternal contribution to each of these cells. So now this is ready to go on and fertilize something. Okay, so in summary, what we see, mitosis produces two identical cells. This is the whole intent, is we want to maintain the same genetic material from generation to generation. So the results of mitosis are a clonal population of cells, and if the parent is 2N, they're all 2N. Meiosis, on the other hand, is going to produce four different cells. So out of the meiotic process, we get diversity rather than uniformity. So each of those four is going to have a different arrangement of the genes and chromosomes present in the parent. Okay. All of these are going to be one end. Uh, one last thing I want to mention before I let you go, and that is uh, the practical aspects of this. That in the gonads, we're going to, all sexes are going to carry out meiosis in their gonads. That's what we're supposed to do, is we produce, the, produce these haploid gametes out of, out of this process. In males, the end result is going to differentiate into sperm. And there, this business is kind of advantageous that we get four cells out of every parent cell. What a deal, because we want to make lots and lots and lots of sperm. So that's your seal straight here. This is, this is kind of what you would expect from mitosis. Is you got the germ cell goes through uh, mitosis multiple times to produce a colony 
of cells of spermatogonium. And then those then divide to produce spermatocytes. Spermatocytes are destined to go on to form sperm. These are going to divide meiotically. So this is a mitotic division, mitotic division. We go into a my, meiosis, and we're going to produce secondary spermos, spermatocytes from the reductional division. And then each of those is going to divide again to generate spermatids, which are haploid cells. And you'll get four of those. Okay, and then those are going to go through a process of differentiation to produce sperm cells. We make it look easy here, but differentiation of these cells is complicated. It takes months to produce each sperm cell. This isn't the hard part. It's that once it has completed the division, you got this little sperm cell. It's got to be modified in all kinds of ways. We're going to get rid of most of the cytoplasm. We've got to grow this tail. Uh, we're going to coat it with various proteins. And that takes months. But the basics here is that for every spermatogonium, uh, we guys are going to produce four sperm. So we can make lots of numerous little gametes. On the female side, it's a little different. So here we go through uh, mitosis, mitosis to produce the primary oocyte. And this is 2N, and then that's going to go into meiosis. And during meiosis, in the first uh, meiotic division, it is an asymmetric division. The reason it does this, the function for this particular kind of asymmetric division, is it produces one teeny tiny little cell called the polar body that is going to be thrown away. And most of the cytoplasm is retained in the oocyte itself. So the female process is uh, intended, if we can use it in, in nature, but anyway, its function is to produce a really large cell. Not as many cells, but the ones that are going to be produced in the ovary are going to be big. So we're going to divide asymmetrically. Then we go through this second meiotic division. And once again, we produce a teeny tiny little polar body here that's going to be discarded. And one large oocyte that's then going to go through another long, involved, elaborate process to produce an ovum. How long does this take? Well, it takes a while. So, every one of you here who has an ovary, you, you set aside your eggs back at this stage, and they're all sitting in your ovary, biding their time until you're, what, 19, 20 years old? That's how old your eggs are. Plus a little bit, because they formed in the embryo. Anyway, they're sitting there, they're just waiting, and uh, then once a month, you are probably painfully aware of this. I don't need to tell any of the women in this classroom this. Maybe you guys don't know about it. You know, okay, good. Yes, but uh, yes, once a month, uh, one or sometimes two of those ova will finish the maturation process and emerge to enter the fallopian tubes and all that stuff and possibly be fertilized. But your ova are huge compared to the sperm. And it's all because of this asymmetric division of the food. Okay. Hey. We've got a few minutes. Are there any questions? Yes? Does it require more energy to produce an ovum than it does like a single sperm cell? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, like I said, they're huge, right? And one of the things that's going on in this process of maturation is that there are supporting cells around them that are packing these with all kinds of nutritious goodies to better enable them to provide sustenance to any possible zygote that produces. 
So yeah, a huge amount of energy goes into this. Uh, there's also a huge amount of energy that goes into making sperm, but per sperm, there's not much. So cheap gametes versus expensive gametes. That's what we're looking at here. Yes? Um, for meiosis and for mitosis. For meiosis or for my what? What's for meiosis and for mitosis. Oh, again, the evolutionary questions, I bet. Yeah. Right. Uh, it looks like, yes, that meiosis is a greatly modified version of mitosis. As, as you can see from the process here, what would have happened is that um, an ancient diploid cell would have just gone through this new division to have the number of chromosomes present. So that's an addition on top of regular mitosis. And when we look at the processes going on in, in meiosis 1, they're very similar to what's going on in mitosis. It's a modified mitosis that's being carried out here. Anything else? Okay, uh, I will be in the genetics lab all afternoon. Uh, if, you, if you didn't get to do your flies yesterday, please do come by today or tomorrow, and we'll get those bottles started. <laughs>